The following program may contain mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. We'd like to acknowledge the support of our integrated Keras and CBC sponsors who make the Juno Awards possible, TD Bank Group, Sirius XM Canada, Freedom Mobile, Ford Canada, and TikTok. We couldn't do what we do without your support. Hi, and welcome to CBC Music in studio at the Junos. My name is Tom Power. I'm the host of Q on CBC Radio 1. I'm excited to be here for a very special interview with the Tragically Hit. Before we get to that, though, uh, we're coming to you from downtown Toronto, which is the Dish with One Spoon territory. Dish with One Spoon is a friendship treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee people. It binds them to share the territory and protect the land. Treaties across the country invite all Canadians and newcomers into meaningful relationships with the First Peoples in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Now, wherever you are in the world, you can tune into the 2021 Juno Awards on Sunday, June 6th. You can watch live on CBC Television and CBC Jam. Listen on CBC Radio 1 and CBC Music. Stream globally at cbcmusic.ca slash junos, or, you know, just give me a call and I'll fill you in. <laughs> uh, the guys sitting in front of me barely need an introduction at all, but they're here, so I might as well give them one. They are, simply put, one of the finest bands our country has ever produced. They began as five buddies from Kingston, Ontario. They cut their teeth in bars and clubs, and before you know it, became fixtures on radio, on much music, headlined arenas around the country, but more importantly, soundtrack the most important, important moments of, of our lives. Their triumphant Man Machine Poem Tour in 2016 was capped off by a nationwide broadcast that was viewed by well over 11 million people across Canada. And this weekend, they'll be honored with the Humanitarian Award at the Junos for their continued dedication to charities and humanitarian causes. They surprised everyone a couple of weeks ago with the brand new album, Saskadelphia. And right now, I'm pleased to welcome Johnny Fay, Paul Langlois, Gord Sinclair, and Rob Baker, the Tragically Hip. Hey, How Tom. are you? Good, hey, Tom. Tom. How are you? Tom. Thank it's you. Nice to see you, guys. So I, I got to say, I, I, I've been thinking about how we were going to do this. And I figured the best way to do it is we'll talk a little bit about the last time we saw you. We'll talk a little bit about now that we're seeing you and hearing you again. And we can talk a little bit about the next time we're going to see you. But we gotta, I, I got to start off with um, the last time I saw you guys all on stage together was, of course, at your concert in Kingston. I think I told Gord the story, but I was backstage at a festival in, in Milwaukee. And we asked, like, the, we're the only Canadian band, and we asked for, like, a backstage dressing room with internet so we could watch the concert. But it was in a laptop, <laughs> and it wasn't loud enough. So we took the laptop and we shoved it in a big frame drum, like a boron, so we could get the amplification coming out. <laughs> and that's how, and then people were walking by saying, well, you know, what are you watching? And as we explained it to them, we saw more and more people gathering around as they learned what it meant to us as Canadians to have that concert. I'm sure you've been hearing stories like that nonstop uh, since that concert. But I'll start, Johnny, with you. What do you remember from that night? Well, for me, it was a, I was talking to somebody the other day about it, and it was a little like being in a spaceship. You know, we were all in that room together. Everyone was observing what was going on. It was a pretty heavy moment, but you still got to play the gig. You know, you still got to go over the songs in your, in your brain. But there were moments that were just, you know, they were totally crazy. And then moments that were just... Uh, you know, we're, we're playing our last few notes as a band and, and soak it in. So um, I, I really love that, you know, a lot of people come up and, and I think for the rest of my life I'll have those stories or we'll all have those stories about, you know, where people were in the country on that night. Um, and so that's really cool. Um, I love that. Paul, how about you? Like, what do you remember from that night? Because it's an interesting point Johnny makes. At some point, you actually just also have to play a gig in addition to dealing with all of these emotions, in addition to dealing with all this um, attention. Yeah, well, I mean, a big upside was that we had played 14 shows already, uh, and it was the last one. And, and that tour, because of Gord's health, we did show day off, show day off, the whole way through. And um, so we were you know, well-oiled and, and um, feeling confident together. But that particular day, you know, it's in Kingston, uh, which is small, I didn't live too far away. I went early, you know, because uh, why wouldn't you? Just to kind of hang out. And I just found myself kind of full of dread, like, ah, this is heavy, and, you know, I don't know, this is... And I wasn't really looking forward to it, and I remember in Soundcheck, um, Gord arrived about then, and uh, Gordownian, um, 
we were talking and he's like, you know what? I'm not nervous, really looking forward to it. I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, no, this is, this is gonna be really cool. And that kind of changed my perspective. It kind of took the weights out of my midsection and um, I started looking forward to it. And then uh, the actual night, you know, we didn't really even notice credit to the CBC. Didn't really notice all the extra and there was a lot of extra cameras and um, stuff going on, but we didn't really notice it because we, we were really focused on the show and, and it was a long set, longer, a little longer than normal. and. Um, so we just had to get inside it. And then what, so once we started playing, it just felt like a good show. We had a full arena. They were, you know, they were into it. And um, so, and the only other thing about it that really stands out is we kept hearing there's a lot of people in Market Square, which was just a couple blocks away. Oh yeah, a lot of people. We're like, really, a lot of people? A lot of people. And then leaving after the show, we did the show and everything, and like a little quick after show, but about an hour later, I asked the guy driving the van, the runner, you know, can you swing by Market Square? I want to see. And there wasn't a soul there. And it was like, you sure there was people here? <laughs> 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 anyway, it's, 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 uh, I just feel lucky to have uh, been a part of it. And, and it seemed to be, well, it was a night that meant a lot to a lot of people. And there wasn't any trouble, uh, which was also another upside. So uh, it's just a, a kind of a feeling of uh, luckiness and, and just uh, happiness for Gord that he was able to achieve that. I remember that last image, you know, of you guys on stage with your arms around each other and Gord in the middle, and that sort of burned into my brain as the image of that night. Rob, what was it like after that, when you went backstage? Uh, it was pretty surreal. The whole thing was very surreal for me. I'm good at uh, compartmentalizing my emotions, and I tried as much as possible to treat it like... Uh, just another day at the office yeah. Uh, because we had a job to do. And then when it was over, uh, I sat down and had a really nice conversation with Gord. Just We chatted for about 20 minutes. And uh, it was very kind of quiet and tender. And then it's the work day is over. Clean out your desk. Go home. There's no gold watch. <laughs> Away <laughs> you go. <laughs> You're done. Yeah, I'm now I'm retired, and you go home and you think I I can deal with all this. It got pretty weird for me. I got you know, I was messed up after the fact. I thought I was good going into it, and when it was all done, I thought I was good, but it, it got hard. How do you mean? Uh, well, you know, if you press all your grief or anger or whatever, you, you bottle it all up. It's gonna come out sometime and it gets messy. Right. Um, Gord, last word to you here on this. What were you feeling? I mean, after the concert, the day after the concert, sort of immediately after the concert. Uh, yeah, I, I echo what the guy said. It, it, was, it was really surreal. I, w I was glad in retrospect that it was in Kingston because my whole day was occupied. I had so many friends, family coming in from out of town and trying to get people in and and trying to get everyone settled. It, I didn't have a lot of time to start worrying or thinking about it or conceiving it of this last time that we were ever gonna play. Um, and again, fortunately, I had a lot of people staying with me. It, it, was a, it was a couple days later. You know, you always get that relief, that feeling of being home at, at the end of the tour, and it's, a, and it's a really good feeling. And then it really began to, to sink in, you know? Like, we started off the whole tour out in Victoria, really not knowing if we were going to get through the first show, let alone the whole tour. And then by the time we got to Kingston, I, th I think I mentioned this to you before, like Gord, got, we all got so buoyed by the audience every night. You know, he would drop a line and the crowd would sing along. You know, he got better. Like, I honestly believe he got better and better. And the band got better and better. And, and yeah, I just didn't want it to ever end, you know. I, I really didn't. I still wish it wasn't over. You know what I mean? And then the r then, then the emotions start kicking in. Yeah. You know, you kind of realize it's like, yeah, that was it. That was it. Can can someone tell me about the first gig? Like the first tragically hip gig? Who remembers very, that? Who yeah, remembers that the very best? Very first gig we ever played. I think it was end of November in 1984, was yeah. it? Yeah. And it was at the Kingston Artists Association. And it was a party for... Christmas party or end of term party for my 
Queen's Fine Arts class. And so we just did it at local gallery artist space. What, what do you remember from that? Which is Please. sorry, which is crazy because you could really, if you open the back door of this place, you could throw a tennis ball and you could hit the K Rock Center. Or yeah, from or it's it that close. Yeah. yeah, it's actually, yeah. You were coming back to where you began. In exactly. Some of yeah. yeah. What, it's, what, it's tell me about the modern, that game. It's called the Modern Field Gallery now. Anyways, uh, we played three sets. I think twelve songs in each set. Uh, I think there are probably two originals in each set and uh, 10 cover songs. I don't know, we played I Love You, Suzanne by Lou Reed and, and Off the Hook by the Rolling Stones. And I don't know, it was all over the map, Poison Ivy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a crazy collection of songs. Did anything from that, those first shows? Robbie books the gig. Yeah. It, yeah, but he also, you know, tabled the name. It was like, we need a name for this because they're going to print these flyers. So, you know. I think one of the other names was the Rusty Bed the Spring the Orchestra. No, or the, the Bed Spring Symphony Orchestra. Bed <laughs> <laughs> the orchestra. And the Tragically Hip. We and stand by our decision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a good last minute change there. <laughs> because I think that one thing that became really clear to all of us while we watched the last show was just that, I mean, just what buddies you guys all are, you know, and all, all were. You know what I mean? That like a band is a band and. You know, a band can be challenging and a band can, can drive you apart, but I saw the closeness of you when you were on stage together. Paul, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, um, I guess it's a bit vague, but like the importance of being friends in the Tragically Hip and how that can sustain you as a band. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's the most important thing, actually. And um, it's how I got in the band. I wasn't, um, I actually didn't even go to that show. I went to a lot of shows. You know, and um, would dance with women. And yeah, we, got, <laughs> we, actually, we actually got Paul in the band because after the second set, he would always leave with the prettiest girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not true, but <laughs> we like to think that way. Uh, now it's, um, you know, they had a sax player, Davis Manning. Uh, was a great guy, and, um, you know, he was wanting to move on, and everyone else was in school, and then they went a little bit, um, this is like a year and a half, and they went a little bit with just four people, and I was, um, you know, best friends of Gord, and I had like, um, you know, I lived with uh, Gord and Gord Sinclair, so we were already friends. Robbie and I um, were playing guitar here and there, so I was friends with him, and I kind of knew Johnny pretty well, and I saved him from a dinosaur uh, once when that's I right. was driving cab. That's and right. Johnny was running from something. We won't go into that. <laughs> we'll, say, we'll, go into that story. we'll say he was running from something. Sure. He was yeah. running from something, and I saw him running on the street. And I was driving my cab by, and I'm like, "Oh, that's Johnny Fay." And so I, get you know, in. pulled over. Yeah, I said, "Get in." And he's yeah. like, I, got, "I don't have any money." I'm like, "I, I, I don't care." And so I think that helped secure his vote yeah. when it came to uh, what, should we get Paul in the band or not. And he's like, oh, yeah, that guy saved me. Uh, anyway, so, um, but I think we operated that way, too. Um, you know, the whole time, um, our friendship was in front of everything. It was important. Gord could not let things go. I mean, if there was a weirdness or some kind of minor issue, or major, but minor issue. He just had to clear the air, he had to. And, and he taught us, really, um, probably more than we taught him, like a, about communication and that kind of stuff. And uh, so we just always, and we were kind to each other. It's like you have a song idea and the band tries it and you know maybe it's not the best. Well, it's not brought up again. No one's like, that's a brutal song. Mm. <laughs> um, so I think we just looked after each other. We, you know, we, we um, uh, but I think it's it's our biggest achievement that, that we're still really good friends and obviously um, and we're with Gord and uh, I think it's yeah it's um, it's the most important thing. Yeah, I'll say we didn't have to bring them in through separate entrances or anything like that. They all <laughs> they all they all came in together. It was it was very amicable. So uh, let's talk about the next time we're going to see it um, on on Sunday night at the Junos. The Tragically Hip are set to perform without Gord Downey for the first time. Feist will be taking the vocals. Gore, tell me how this came about to do this performance with Feist. Uh, the possibility of playing the Junos was tabled a little while back. 
Um, and frankly, we none of us were super, super interested. You know, we just we hadn't played together and weren't really interested in playing without Gord. And then uh, Jake Gold, our manager, uh, suggested Feist uh, might step into Gord's shoes. And, and I think it was really the first time collectively we kind of all like stopped for a minute. It's like, wow, that's a, that's a pretty cool idea. You know, I think Gord, Gord would have really loved it. He, you know, we've known Leslie for an awful long time from that, her very first tour with By Divine Right. She was playing with, with Jose and the, and the, and the crew and got to know her well back then and really admired what she's done. And, and it just, it, it just seemed like a, a really good idea. And, and yeah, I won't give away what we played or anything, but uh, both Paul and, and John sort of independently of each other suggested the same song and and anyway yeah it just it just seemed like the the cool right thing to do at the right time for for all of us you know and it was it was yeah it's, a, it's just a great it was great our very first rehearsal like we kind of we were pretty terrible the first run through and then by the second one it all you know it all came back really quick we kind of remembered how much we listened to each other you know and went, once we got the mouse nests and stuff out of our amps and stuff <laughs> Literally in Paul's case. <laughs> 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 you had a, a mouse in the amp? Apparently so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, I saw you not along there. Tell me how it felt when you started playing music again with the boys. You mean, uh, we, you know... Yeah, just rehearsing for this thing. Re rehearsing, well, rehearsing, we went back to Bath, and uh, we were up in the, um, in the rafters at the back of the house where we had, you know being five years earlier with Gord and I'm saying sitting there with Robbie and there was his exercise bike, you know, right there, you know. And um, it was, you know, it, it's a time of year that we would be preparing for um, a tour, you know, a Canadian tour or, you know, going to the States. And so just arriving and, and being the first there, I'm just, you know, waiting for the other guys to show up and, and Gord too, you know, it just, it just, um, and so that was that was a very heavy moment. And it, but you know, uh, Gord's brothers, Mike and Pat, are um, you know are are very present in our lives now, and that is uh, a, a great comfort. I find I think that you know having them close by and um, you know seeing that they're okay with things and you know bouncing things off of them is 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 a big uh, big one for us. Um, you know. So I, I think uh, you know being there in Bath, and it was just it was just very natural. And it's funny because the thing that one of the things that I miss the most is that creative process. And you know, Robbie and I were upstairs, and he started playing a riff that wasn't the song that we were playing, and I I started to play with it. And it's that that creative thing that just was so much fun about the hip. You know, even if we had a disagreement or something, we would always come together in the, in the music, as, as Paul said, you know. And by the end of that day, we'd be listening to it and happy. And, and so definitely um, made me thankful for, you know, very reflective and thankful for what we have, what we had achieved, you know. Rob, it was maybe um, pretty surprising. Because I know when I, I, I think you were the first member of the hip I talked to after Gord's uh, death. And you said to me something, I mean, I'm not putting you on the spot here, but you said to me something like, I don't know, man. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to do that again, you know, play these songs again, pick up the guitar again. I understood it, you know, a tremendous amount of grief, and, and we can talk a little bit about that. But So I'm, I'm curious to hear you, man, when you went in there and you started playing this music again, how did you feel? Uh, there, was, there was a lot that was lost, you know. We lost our best friend. Uh, you lose your job. But uh, I kind of felt like lost the brotherhood as well. Uh, and the best part of being in a band is you do everything together. You enjoy the good moments, the bad moments. You know, it's a great review, bad review. You, <laughs> you go through it together. And uh, we all went through Gord, grieving Gord separately. We all went our separate ways. And uh, it was hard. And I just thought, uh, I'm retired I'm leaving it all behind and I couldn't <laughs> I found the only way you know if I didn't play 
my mind would fixate on stuff and I'd just uh, have these things rolling around in my head and uh, making me really miserable. So I just started going down in my studio and working and working and working and just as a way of keeping all that, all those thoughts at bay, keeping the voices quiet. So to actually get together and play with other people and your best friends, it's, it's pretty incredible. And as Johnny said that, you know, we, n we never really rehearsed as a band. It's nothing we ever did. Uh, we'd get together with maybe the, the idea we were going to rehearse and then someone starts playing a riff or Johnny's tuning up his drums and laying down a beat and someone starts to play and so someone else joins in and it was always that. It was just the jamming, the exploring, the creative uh, avenue rather than just trying to get songs tight. So when that, you know, as Johnny said, when that happened, that, that felt pretty good. I think if you listen really closely right now, you can hear Tragically Hip fans in their cars screaming at me right now, yelling at me to ask this question, so I'm going to ask it. Does this mean that there might be future touring? I mean, anyone who wants to take this one. Future touring, future gigs for, for the hip? My bones are turning to powder. I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think I could do a week on a tour bus at this point in my life. I, I kind of feel like we've done, you know, I would, uh, I'll plead Sean Connery on this, never say never, but uh, playing gigs, that's one thing. Going on a tour, I don't know. I kind of did that for 35 years of my life. It's a, yeah, it's a pretty daunting thing. I mean, the two hours of that day, are, as Gord Downing would say, are, are the gold, and then it's the other 22 that just are just, you gotta put yourself out there. You're missing a lot of stuff at home. And, you know, some of them went on, you know, there were a lot of things that were missed, you know? And um, yeah, there's, there's sort of a, a chapter that's finished, you know? Um, yeah, I would never say never. Um, it was it was really fun to get together and play. You know, be nice to get together and create again. I don't know. It's just uh, yeah. You must have people. Johnny, didn't Dan Aykroyd call you from my show? He did. He did. We yeah. had Dan Aykroyd on, and uh, he <laughs> said he said you think the hip's gonna get back together? Do you think the hip's gonna go back <laughs> on the road? It's a bad Dan Aykroyd. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know, man. Why are you asking me? I don't even know these guys. But like maybe. And he said, I'll call him right now. And then on the air, he called you. That's right. To ask yeah. you. So that must be happening a fair bit, right? People are asking you these <laughs> questions, right? Yeah. Not Dan Aykroyd, you know, but. No, but people asking about it. Yeah, and what I mean, we had said we weren't going to, and now here we here we are, playing with Leslie. Yeah. Um, because that was such a, I mean, a curveball, like in, in the best way, kind of like okay, so that's not going to be, some guy trying to, sing like Gord or some yeah. guy trying not to sing like Gord, and, um, but this is a very specific scenario, and um, you know, we were getting um the humanitarian award and you know the heat was on and and as gord was saying like it was it was like a no until feist came up um now i mean i think we're all looking forward to monday and it this being behind us and getting back into our you know um yes it's retired but we're all doing our chipping away at our own little musical things i'm sure and um and the consideration of us doing anything, um, you know, besides backing that Italian singer um, <laughs> yeah, that is doing Italian versions of hip songs. There's, like, and there's an Italian guy doing Italian versions of hip there songs? There is. doing great yeah. versions, yeah. It's, it's really it's interesting. You'd never Luca, think, but it's amazing. Luca Tati, I think is his name. Yeah, I'm not and sure. He, uh, I guess he was quite a popular or relatively popular singer, songwriter in Italy and during the lockdown. He discovered the hip and did a deep dive and <laughs> went through the whole catalog and then started posting these videos of him singing. First one I think was Long Time Running and then mm -hmm. he did Good Life and now I, he's in the studio making an album of all hip songs. And he I says, think he did Bob Cajun in the yeah, time. He, uh, he said the tragically hip saved my life. <laughs> there's a, there, I see that there's the path going forward. I understand, you know, you know. So oh. maybe a three week tour of Italy. 
<laughs> in the winter any, in Canada? Any, yeah. any reason to go to Italy. Is good. Instead of having to do Manitoba in a bus again, maybe you'll uh, in February. <laughs> Those were fun gigs, though. Those were, Manitoba oh, yeah. was the very first place that we got on a plane. Jake got us tickets, um, and we went out to do um, Donnie Lalonde's place, Corner Boys, because we were given a gig out there, and we got in a plane, and we went out there with our gear in the back, and that's when it was like, that's one of the moments I was like, look, this is, this is cool. Yeah. And we're musicians, and we're traveling. And You're a real uh, band. And we went, we were out of province, and we went to, w and we were treated like gold in, in Manitoba, the yeah. first you know, first little trip out there was amazing. So. Yeah, you know, you're right. You guys have that in common. You know, you weren't afraid of the cold bus tours. Well, that was in a, in a way that was Jake setting that up, and and he's really the architect for us, our touring style because he would cut these deals with, you know, lighting and PA when it was cheaper and bus guys and uh, no, there was not a lot of traffic out there. Yeah. And tickets would go on sale in November. And so people would give them as Christmas presents and keeping yeah. the ticket price low. That was all, that was all Jake. Yeah, you guys, I mean, I, I shouldn't be talking too selfishly here, but I remember you guys, like, not a lot of bands came to Newfoundland. Yeah. Like, we didn't get a lot of bands come, and you guys always came on yeah. every tour. Well, it's the same, it was the same with us in Kingston. You know, we didn't get a lot of shows, and so we were aware of that across the country. Like, in, in February in Brandon, Manitoba, all due respect, I don't think there's a lot going on except the, you know, the weekings or something. And, and yeah, so we, we in, in deference to that, you know, we would go out on the road in the, the dark the dark months and, and it was an exciting thing because we remember that when we were kids, like when the, you know, lining up for the Bee Gees when they came to Kingston to start off a tour at, at our old barn. And it was, yeah, it was a real big deal. And that's a, it's really the quintessential Canadian thing, I think. Yeah, Air Supply. I remember going to see Air Supply in St. John's <laughs> because it was something to go see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think a, a lot of bands used to uh, do their dress rehearsals, I think, in, in Newfoundland, didn't they? Yeah, they did. I think Neil, Tina Neil Young Turner did. It too, did yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, Neil brought out his, like, his roadie crew was playing with him that night because like, you know, I guess the rest of Crazy Horse hadn't arrived. And yeah, it was a great place to see bands warming up. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Rush started uh, Hemispheres in Kingston at the Memorial Center. That's mm -hmm. where they played the first show. So yeah. they were there a couple of days early and blowing out the cobwebs, mm -hmm. you know. The Rush was my very first show ever yeah. at the Memorial Center. Mine too. I get goosebumps thinking about it. Yeah. Oh, you, sorry, I thought you said that. <laughs> Rush was your first show and you said, I think, I can, I think I'm gonna do that. Uh, yep. <laughs> oh, I I think I already wanted to do that. Yeah. I was way into it. Yeah, they opened with Bastille Day. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul described earlier the, the the situation that you're in now, playing this gig with Feist, uh, as a bit of a curveball thrown your way, right? And I want to talk a little bit about the picture of that curveball, which is the Junos, which is presenting you with the 2021 Humanitarian Award, which recognizes outstanding Canadian artists whose humanitarian contributions have positively enhanced the social fabric of Canada and beyond. Um, Gord, you guys have won uh, 17 Junos. This one obviously must feel a bit different. Yeah, it, yeah, it does. We, it, again, it's not something that we ever really set out to do. We just always sort of felt it was the right thing to do and part of what we were to do. Um, you know, I remember really early in our career, like it was 1991, I, I, I talked about this last night, just we, we were invited by Rush for their holiday concert at Maple Leaf Gardens. Um, this is right at the tail end of touring Road Apples. Um, and for us, that was going to be like, wow, we're playing with Rush, our, our first show in the gardens. And we were like, this is as big as it's ever going to get. You know, in our lives, moms and dads all came to the show. And then it kind of dawned us throughout the whole thing that the whole, this big, it's Maple Leaf Gardens, and the guys in Rush are donating it all back to local charities, you know, to benefit the community. And the light bulb kind of, we'd done small shows, and a lot of local musicians, all, they were always the first to line up to play a benefit show. Yeah. We really are. Um, but then it dawned on us, like the scale and the possibility that you could do with this. And really from that moment on, we, we focused a lot on, on what was happening in our community. And every time we played in Kingston, we, we all always left the proceeds in town to various, various charities and set up our own foundation. And again, it's not something we did, we just d did it because it was the right thing to do. You know, it's kind of in our DNA and, and, and again, Gord, uh, he 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 led from the front in that regard. He was he was energetic and and 
and went above and beyond to, to, to always do the right thing. What do you think would have made of this honor here? Uh, I think he would have seen it as an opportunity to do more, to make a to make a statement, to get people off their asses, to to pitch in help. It's been it's it's interesting talking to you about Gord because I do feel um, like sort of a hole in the conversation, you know, where he would be, and I'm I'm sure you you, you all feel that too, and it's not lost on me, and I think I said this to you, Gord, when you came on, that what is a loss of a icon to us, um, an entertainer to us, someone who soundtracked and, and, you know, and made us think deeply about different things in our lives to us, is, as Paul said earlier, a loss of a buddy to you. And when you lose a friend, when you lose a brother, you don't normally have to lose them so publicly and you don't normally have to grieve them so publicly. Johnny, um, how, how was that? Um, well, you know, the, the, the final tour, I really believe, and I've talked to Pat about this, that, um, you know, that Gord wanted to do that to make sure that things were good with his family, but he also wanted to make sure that we were all right, you know, and, um, and as Gord said, you know, as, as his endorphins got going and, you know, I remember in, in Calgary and Edmonton, you'd see him up later and later every night and that the people were just feeding him. It just, you know, it was, it was amazing to see. He knew that he was going to be healed by getting in front of people. But, um, yeah. 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 It's uh, the, the, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. The loss. Yeah. It's, it's, it's extremely heavy. Yeah. How are you doing now these days, Paul? Uh, I'm doing good. This this is a nice um, this Juno thing. Getting back to these guys, you know, uh, getting back with Jake, like about a year ago. Um, we had all, I think, been in kind of a fog-ish. I mean, we communicated a bit, but um, everyone did their own thing and. There was no sort of drive or enthusiasm for anything. And um, with it, the last year since uh, Jake brought a little renewal um, to us. And um, and so we're more, you know, Zoom calls and figuring things out because we have a few things going on. You yeah. know, we got a studio and, um, you know, wine and a cider and that kind of thing. There's things going on. But to, to actually get together and play music, I, you know, that's... That feels good. As far as Gord goes, you know, I mean, it's, for he and his kids, it's unfair, and, and um, I'll never not be sad about that, you know, that he could have done, he could have done so much more. Um, but he did so much, so that's the upside. And he accepted, he was very accepting. I mean, he fought, he fought hard, but um, he was also, more grateful than anything it always whisper in your ear like god i'm so glad you stuck with me it's like well wasn't that hard <laughs> you know and um so you know uh, that's really the only grief i've had in my life and uh it's been big it's big time like they say you know all those all those sayings around death um are there because they're true you know it's like time does help but um, yeah, I, I just like to picture him with me, you know, and um, you know, in general, have a pretty good idea that um, he would be happy we're all doing well and that we're doing the odd thing together. You know, this in particular, uh, he loved Leslie. I, I love what you said there that you're, you're picturing him alongside you because I think in, instead of thinking about Gord is gone, I'd love to spend a moment thinking about when he was with us. And um, Gord, I'll, I'll go to you on this. When you picture Gord Downey in your mind right now, your old buddy, your bandmate, what's the what's the image you see in your head? I, I, I maybe it's because we've been going through the Road Apple stuff and being in Saskadelphia, but I I go back, I go back to the van, you know, when it was it was us, you know, five of us and Dave Powell, another dear friend of ours, that we lost, and just. 
you know, that in, just that enthusiasm we had before we really had started families, and we were, we we had come across the country. You know, we the band had stuck together through that first tour. You know, it break, the country breaks up so many bands just because of the traveling, and it made us tighter. And we were just coming into our own as collective songwriters. You know, where like we're doing now, you sit in your basement and try to finish a song. With with this group, we you know we communicated musically as well, and we were always writing. And Gord was just and he was journaling all the time and writing all our adventures down and they would come back around in in the song form and stuff and i you know that's the stuff i remember i really do you know the kerchief around his head and we were all smoking butts back then we were, you know poor johnny and robbie we'd smoke them out of the van <laughs> <laughs> you know that's the stuff i remember you know like you know time being what it is like you start families and and you, you slowly drift apart but we always had the band to come back to you know we would start just like robbie said earlier we'd start writing again and it was just the just the coolest thing and it, but that during that time you know when we were young men we were doing it all the time. We were writing in hotel rooms and sound checks, and, and it was just like this discovery that, wow, you know, we're we're a band on stage, but we're also a creative unit too. Like the the songs we were writing together were way better than the songs we were writing individually, you know. And that was cool. That's a to me, that's a unique form of communication that that I think our band was was really good at. So Johnny, I could see you kind of going when I was asking Gord about the the image in, in the mind of Gord Downey, so I'm, I'm gonna go to you on this. When you picture Gord Downey in your head, what do you, what do you see? I just think of him as a, you know, a, a beautifully kind person. I mean, you were, when you were in the room with him, he was, and you were talking to him, as you know, you, he was focused on you. He wasn't sort of uh, uh, anywhere else. And um, he really, he was a champion of a lot of great causes. And, uh, you know, I remember one time, we were getting ready to do a tour and we were very close to doing it. And uh, he said, we, we need to power this with uh, bullfrog power. And we didn't know really anything much about it. <laughs> it was like, okay. And it was like, it's, it's clean, it's better for the environment. We're, this is what we're gonna do. And this has gotta happen. And uh, he, he was, I mean, as Paul said, if he wanted something to happen, he just was unrelenting. He just, <laughs> you know, and I, it's the drive. You know, I remember, Another thing I remember about, um, you know, uh, being in England and we were recording fully completely and he had given me a cassette of um, the Sky Diggers and the song was um, on it, um, A Penny More. And I just remember sonically listening to this every night before I'd go to bed and it was, you know, on a Walkman or something <laughs> like that and thinking, wow, this is like, this is, these guys are really going to, uh, you know, be bigger than us. And he said, no, we're doing something equally as cool. It's going to be different, but it's going to be really good. And I just, I, it was just like, he had so much confidence and he could, he could give you that little boost, you know, uh, he did, he did for me a, a bunch of times and I, I love that. And, and it, it was very secure to have him there. Um, you know, like an older brother, like these guys are, are my brothers, but Gord, that's what I, I remember about him. Just the comfort and the, the beauty and the, um, um, just the love. Yeah. yeah, generosity. I remember the first time I met him, he had no reason to be nice to me. You know what I mean? Like, I was just some arsehole from Newfoundland, you know? And, <laughs> and He loved Newfoundland, though. He went there on uh, his um, honeymoon. honeymoon. Yeah. yeah. It was like, I'm coming back here <laughs> in a month <laughs> for my honeymoon, by the way. And he met some people on th on that tour, and he was like, uh, you know, uh, we want to go fishing. We want to see here. Will you drive us around, or will you? can you direct us? And the he had a grand time. He loved it. Uh, we loved him too, though. He was, a, he, was, he, was, he was officially one of us. He didn't even need, he to, was. He didn't need to kiss the card or anything like that. <laughs> um, it's been really great to hear you guys again on the Saskadelphia recordings. Um, it's really good. <laughs> like, it's really great music um, that I think all of us are just kind of blown away by. Rob, what was it like to hear this again for the first time? Uh, it was pretty incredible, actually. I knew that I think we all knew that a lot of these songs were out there and it was a, just a matter of tracking them down. Johnny led the charge on that and it was all inspired by the universal fire. Yeah, because we thought they were lost, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I read in the New York Times, I was in Rome doing a painting course <laughs> with the University of Washington in Rome for some reason. <laughs> and uh, I would read the New York Times every morning and 
there it was, this big fire and a list of the artists, you know, and sandwiched right between Mel Torme and the family Von Trapp <laughs> was uh, the Tragically Hip. I was like, oh, God. And I got on the phone to Johnny, and and uh, he said, yeah, for sure. We had tapes there. Don Smith used that storage facility, and, and that would be 60 tapes, 60 rolls of two-inch or more from Road Apples and all the tapes from up to here. And that, in a way, that was kind of the spark that, started to pull us back together and uh, the quest to uh, track these tapes down, see if they still existed. And it turns out they'd been shipped up to Toronto at some point, I guess when we left Universal or MCA USA. Uh, they were, and we stayed with Un Universal Canada, MCA Canada. So they shipped everything up north un unbeknownst to us. What a relief to yeah. think that you had lost these recordings. Yeah, we still haven't found them all. They're right. still... I think like we found 35 of 60. 35, rolls. yeah, about 35, 40. Yeah. Yeah. And Johnny went through it. So to hear it, I, you know, I, I remembered some of these songs being good. There were some that I had no idea, like Reformed Baptist Blues. I had no idea that we'd even played that down there. But I guess there must have been a day when Don just said, play, empty the cupboard, you know, whatever you got. Because we, that was a staple of the set in probably 80. 586. Oh, yeah. Like even before, before, the, the, before the Baby Blue album or the, the EP. And it was long out of the set by then. I don't think we'd probably played it in years. So funny to hear that emerge from that session. Uh, what really got me was uh, hearing Gord's voice talking between songs. And, uh, you know, I'm listening with headphones on and suddenly he's in my head talking. And it was, uh, there were a few times where I just had to, like, stop it put it away and I'll come back to that in a week yeah. it's a little overwhelming sometimes Paul how was it for you listening back to this uh, great you know I, I when it was sent to us after you know Johnny managed to find a bunch and then we got um, you know the tapes have to be baked um, certain temperature then you get a couple passes and um, and Mark Reekin, our longtime uh, sound expert, um, ended up remixing this stuff in honor of Don Smith, you know, trying to do Don's mi mix. Because Don didn't officially mix these tracks. So, um, anyway, so I, we might have just got the mix versions before we got the master versions. And I had them there on my computer. And I went a couple of days without pushing play really because uh, yeah because i just thought mm, i don't know i don't know I don't, I don't think it's not that i'm not going to like it but i just don't think it's going to be up to scratch so i was quite shocked pleasantly uh that it was like whoa this is this sounds like us in road apples you know like th we were very confident we were kind of mid to late 20s full of energy we did nothing but play on that session we just played all the time and then at the very end of late night we'd listen to everything we did that day i mean that's what bands do you know yeah. that's the most fun part is listening at the end of the day but we recorded a lot and don wanted us to play a lot and so these songs were much uh you know i mean it's kind of like necessary how didn't how did that not make the record you know there's probably a story for each one but what we were doing was focusing on the record and what's going to be best. You know, the uh, 11 songs was a magic number and to us and, um, you know, or 11-ish. And so we just had those songs and, and we had these other songs that had been here. And, but then all of a sudden it was kind of like it, it was kind of a matter of sequence and vibe and what works with what and what covers the same bass, like, ouch, kind of a little bit twist my arm. Um, but it wasn't like we were like, is it ouch or twist my arm? It's just, it was a natural occurrence. And then when we left to drive home, this was Road Apples. The other <laughs> songs, see ya. Right. And we we didn't even, you know, we pulled out, out once in a while, but um, they're just kind of, they were for the rear view mirror, and we kind of forgot about them because what we wanted to do was keep writing new songs, and we already w were, and which mm -hmm. led to Fully Completely. 
So we always wanted to just keep moving on once we'd made those decisions. So I was actually uh, very happy about it. Like it's like it's up to scratch. It's it sounds like it sounds like that band at the time, and it really was in the same place with the same producer, and um, that's why I think it's so exciting. You know, it's because. Uh, it was that long ago. It's just kind of wacky, and I love it. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't sound like Castaways. Like it sounds like the hip. It's what I really love about it. You know, Johnny, you're like the Indiana Jones of this thing. You know. <laughs> well, uh, you, a little bit. You know, I, if you're not getting the answer you want, you just go somewhere else. And it was really kind of um, interesting how I got. Um, I have a friend whose dad is a drummer. Um, in uh, and his m name is uh, Mike Hug, and um, he's in um, oh god, what's the, the band is um, Manford Man. Oh yeah, uh, in England, and um, it, it, one of the sisters gave me their card because they worked in the legal department at uh, Universal Music in in London, and we had a record that was missing, and so I phoned her up, and I felt you know the Brits know a few things about you know cataloging things, so if I phone her, maybe she can help you know find us and she said I got your stuff I got it I found it and so for me it was just like you just have to pick up the phone and phone somebody and then maybe they'll help you find things and and you know for this it was really great and really helped bring us together because we were communicating we were talking about um, titles because Gord was a big one for changing the title of the song sometimes five hours before it went to printing Oh so yeah, really? like, well, what, oh, what yeah. the hell yeah. was that one? <laughs> <laughs> what was that one again? No, that w that was uh, locked in the boot of a lorry. You, know, uh, <laughs> you mean uh, you know, dumping the body, locked yeah. in the trunk of a car? <laughs> so those kind of things, and we just kind of all triangulated it, and it was it was a nice fact finding, you know, some archaeology there. But it was it was comforting, I think. It helped in the the the, the process of what we're going through now. And and you brought in Mike Downey, right, Gord's brother. Yeah. Can you tell me that story? Uh, Mike Mike Downey um, brought him in to hear the music. Oh yeah. Well, he was uh, he's been you know doing a little bit of filming. He's a great documentarian, and and um, it was heavy to be in the room. Like when I was listening to stuff, um, it was like okay, this was our work, you know. And then when Mike was in the room, a family member, and I listened to a very spare version of Robbie and Gord. Uh, playing the very first versions of Fiddler's Green. Very just beautiful and moving. And then Daniel Lamois' house reverberating away in New Orleans. And I looked up at him and I lost it because it was like his voice was, he was always going for it. Gorg, and you know, and you hear it on this, these tracks that he was always nailing it. <clears throat> all, of the, all of the tracks that he sang. Uh, and, and this version of Fiddler's Green was just like, I was a chocolatey mess listening to it. You know, yeah, you I had to turn it off. I couldn't, I couldn't make it through. It took me, I think it was the third time I listened that I was able to get through it. So it was just, it was too much. <laughs> how was, how was Mike? He w he was a bit of a mess too. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he wasn't prepared for it at all. Um, but it was also, I think it was. He, he said it was comforting to hear his brother. You know, and as Robbie said, that the in between song stuff that we kept on this was really great. You know. Um, but I think it's just that added bonus. Is there more to come? No. This is it? This is it, yeah. Well, I'm not going <laughs> to complain about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, we're, we really are just taking it day by day. We've, we've done this. This took two years to get to this point. Yeah. You know, of searching, finding out what was in the fire, um, getting Mark Breakin on board. You know, Jake was involved. So it's, it's taken two years to get these six songs. And what a, what a response, hey? Like, I was looking at um, even just Spotify before I came here to see the numbers for these, these songs, you know, in the hundreds of thousands, doing incredibly well. It was all over Hockey Night in Canada for the Leafs and Habs. Like, the I, I was talking to so many people who on the way to the cabin or the cottage, as they say up there, were, uh, were listening to it, you know, and couldn't, couldn't get enough of it. Uh, Gord, what was it like to see the reception to this music from all these years ago? Yeah, it's... It, it, it's it's really it's heartwarming and, and 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 buoying at the same time. I went out for an early morning paddle in my canoe at my cottage, and one of my neighbors said, "Hey, they were listening to your music up pretty late last night across <laughs> the," and and they were. You could hear it from across the lake. Someone had picked it up, you know. And it's it's it means a lot 
that it means a lot to people, you know, and it, it means different things for us, you know, you hear, you know, Don Smith isn't with us anymore, and neither is Bruce, Bruce Barris, and of course Gore and Dave Powell, you know, instrumental in making us what we were, you know, and that's what I hear, you know, I, I, I hear the house again, and, and like I was saying earlier, it's just, for me, it's a time machine, I just go, I go right back there, I, I, it's funny, I remember more about the experience and the actual recording. I'm with Robbie. I didn't even remember that we recorded Reform Baptist Blues, but I could probably tell you, you know, what I ate from the Verity Mart every day that I was down there. It was just, you know, the camaraderie. And uh, and Don Don Smith brought that out brought that out in us, you know, like we were we were a bar band and we were hitting it real, real hard and and, and I think he's the main reason that songs like Fiddler Screen and Long Time Running and last of the unplucked gems we wrote while we were in the studio you know he he had us playing all the time and exploring our different facets of what we could do and and he made us a band in a lot of ways you know a lot of ways and that's what i hear when i listen back to the to this stuff you know i was gonna say i don't think i could listen to the studio version of fiddler's green those days you know much less what you were you were listening to i mean i have a hard time listening to it any any time it's just the most beautiful yeah, song it, it was uh after well, writing it, Gord Sinclair came in with that guitar riff, and then uh, when we heard those lyrics, it was such a personal story for Gord. And uh, we recorded the song, and it was intense to record, very emotional. And then we never played that song. Like, we just, it's on the album, that's its life. We can't play that in concert. And it took years before we pulled it out. You did it in Kingston, didn't you do it at the last show? We did. Uh, uh, we pulled it at one time, uh, Kelly from uh, Stereophonics, I think they did a version of it. Uh, it was a B-side of a single of theirs, and uh, we were in London, he said he wanted to do it. And that may have been one of the first times that we played it live, I think, yeah. was to get Kelly up on stage. I, um, I hope, well it's been great to talk to you, I hope that what you heard when you heard of people listening to your music and streaming Saskadelphia and buying it and was the deep sense of love that people in this country have for your band. A deep abiding sense of love and affection and gratitude. And I hope each of you feel that um, through their response to this music. Mm -hmm. And if I can so. be the vessel to transmit some of that, let me be that. <laughs> so thanks a lot for the music, guys. Thank you, Tom. Thank, we'll, thank you. Tom. We'll go out on one last question, and I'll make it. A, I'll make it a tough one, and for each of you. Okay. I want to ask you each how you want the tragically hip to be remembered. And Gord, I'll start with you. <laughs> Giving you lots of time. Lots to of time. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I think you just said it right there. You know, any artist wants their output to, to not only endure but actually mean something. Hopefully uplift people, you know, like Fiddler's Green's a really good example, you know, my uh, Charles Gillespie and my brother Colin died from the same um, congenital heart defect and, um, and y you take comfort in that, in that stuff, I take comfort in music every day you know, I have happy songs, I have sad songs, stuff that I have to listen to at certain, when I'm feeling a certain way and if we can do that you know, for anybody and, and Gord's words you know, I, I think that's, you know, what more can you want as a legacy, I think. Johnny, how about you? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I've given it a lot of thought lately. Just, you know, the, the band is going to live beyond us, you know, our music. And I think a little bit of what, you know, maybe we wanted to do is to honor Gord. And, you know, people ask questions about Gord, you know. What was he like? You know, what were the things he was writing about? Well, here's here's some stuff on Saskadelphia. You know, um, the band how to be remembered, and uh, you know, Ray Daniels, who's Russia's manager, I was talking to him one night, and he said there are three things that are Canadian: beer, hockey, and the tragically hip. <laughs> and I manage Rush. Do you know how hard that is for me to say? That? <laughs> Ray's a beautiful man. And he's an incredible manager, and. Um, and I never really ha sort of heard it that way. I was like, you know, and, and that was beautiful to hear that that way. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you make a little bit of a difference, then yeah, that's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with beer hockey and 
and the tragic we hit. Rob, how about you? How should the band be remembered? How would you like the band to be remembered? Uh, I guess uh, that we were kind people. We tried hard. Isn't, isn't that enough? Isn't that all, <laughs> isn't that all, isn't that all you... Um, maybe... No, the, that's the, beautiful. The, <laughs> the Cordy House of rock and roll. How's that? Sharp elbows <laughs> and tried really hard. <laughs> uh, we've had a, a record on the charts in five decades now. How about that? It's, it's, I, my wife Leslie told me that the other day. She said, your record's number one in Canada. That's the fifth decade that you've charted with a record. That's pretty weird. Very strange. Paul, last word to you from the fella driving a cab, picking up future members <laughs> when they were being chased <laughs> by dinosaurs to this moment right now. How do you want the band to be remembered? Um, it was, uh, I don't think we're going to be remembered um, how, how we remember it. I mean, it, it, um, it was far more work and dedication um, probably than anyone thinks. Like, I'm, I'm specifically talking about the touring. But the touring led into a recording, and uh, we kind of never stopped. So I, I hope we're remembered as uh, a band that, that really played well live and we're, we're kind of like a really nice, solid, you know, form-like thing that uh, could turn on a room. And I think, you know, um, the output, we, we, we didn't stop. It's not like we uh, ever really stopped. So, you know, that's what's really going to live on is the songs. And, you know, we w went on to make many other records after that Road Apples yeah. uh, and now Saskadelphia thing. And some would term experimental. Some were kind of back, uh, back to our roots. But... Um, you know, I'm happy that we're in the conversation as one of uh, bands of, of uh, that that people like and people have love for. It, it's the songs, the recorded songs, that will likely, um, you know. So I would just, I, I would, I would say, I'd like to be us to be remembered as a career band, a band that um, made a life of it, and um, you know, even though uh, Gord. Uh, is gone far too soon. It wasn't like we had a six-year run. You know, we had a 32-year run together, um, 30 years together, and um, you know, so that's no small thing. And um, you know, it's obvious from how he's remembered with such love. Um, you know, we'd like to squeeze into that too. And I know he loved, he loved his band, the Hip, and um, yeah. So I just hope we're remembered for. Our work ethic and our output. I love it. Guys, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Lovely thank to talk you. to you. Thanks for making the time. Thank you, Tom. Congratulations on the Juno, and we'll see you at the Junos. Well, thanks, Tom. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. I can't wait to tune into the performance. To wh wherever you are in the world, you can tune into the 2021 Juno Awards on Sunday, June 6th. Watch live on CBC TV and CBC Jam. Listen on CBC Radio 1 and CBC Music. Stream globally at cbcmusic.ca. Slash Junos. It'll be a good night for the power grid in Kingston because everyone will be inside watching this. Uh, you're also invited to check out the full schedule of live streams that CBC Music has planned all week, including a session from CBC Music's The Block tomorrow night, the Reclaimed Showcase happening Thursday night, both happening at 8 p.m. Eastern. Go to cbcmusic.ca slash Junos for all the details. Thanks a lot for watching. Later on. Bye.